guys, here we are back again and uh, looking forward to the very end of the book. Uh, we'll be reading chapter six today. It's definitely the shortest chapter. The last chapter was shorter than some of the other chapters as well. So this one should you know, be a nice way to wrap up the book. Uh, we've got some things kind of dangling. We left on, on a bit of a cliffhanger. So I hope you're excited to find out how it all ends up. Um, before we go, um, Let's talk about, let me talk about what's making me happy today. I don't ever hear from you guys, so hopefully you have reasons to be happy. Um, but uh, what's making me happy today is I just was able to go out for a run. Uh, now I'm sitting here and my puppy is sitting next to me and chewing on something that he shouldn't be chewing on. You might even be able to hear him in the background. Uh, so, you know, it's the little things, guys. It's the little things. Hopefully whatever you're doing... Uh, to stay happy. You're also, also healthy, safe, and sane. So let's talk about chapter six now. Let's start a little bit with uh, reading comprehension, the types of things that we should be uh, making sure that we understand so that we know what's going on in the end of the book. Uh, first of all, how we should be able, by the end of this, of the book, to be able to answer how does George act to protect Lanny from the gang of men? Um, and just as a reminder for that, uh, remember where we, we left off was Lenny had killed, um, Curly's wife. Curly had kind of wrestled up, a, a gang of, of ranch hands and they had some guns and they were going to go after Lenny and their goal is to kill Lenny by shooting him in the guts. Um, um we also kind of found out that George had probably stolen a gun um, and was maybe kind of pointing pointing the, the group, the, the posse, in the wrong direction. So our question is, what is George going to do uh, in order to protect Lenny? And second, who wins and who loses in the end? And can we even answer that question? So the end is, uh, it's a well-known ending, and it's a very, it's a very much up in the air ending as well uh, in terms of who the winners and who the losers are. Um, so I want you to just think about it. It's a very, uh, this is almost an analysis question more so than a comprehension question, but I want you to think about it. And then in terms of analysis, um, is Lenny responsible for his actions? Why or why not? So by the end, we should be thinking about, you know, what is Lenny's responsibility for what he's done? Um, is George a kind person? And what makes you say so? You know, we've been presented with George as being, you know, sometimes a little bit harsh and other times really nice. So ultimately, is George a kind person? And then finally, uh, was the dream of the little place with the rabbits a realistic dream? Why or why not? It seems clear to us after the last chapter that probably it's not going to happen anymore because of what was going on on the farm. But, you know, by the end, was it ever realistic for them to even think that they could have accomplished it? And why or why not? So with those things in mind, let's read chapter six. Chapter six, by the way, takes place at the same place that chapter one did, so the place where Lenny was told to go back to. The deep green pool of the Salinas River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had left the valley to go, to go climbing up the slopes of the Gabalin Mountains, and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool among the mottled sycamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side, and it swam the length of the pool and came to the, to the legs of a motionless heron that stood in the shadows. A silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it out by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake while its tail waved frantically. A far rush of wind sounded and a, great, uh, and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sycamore leaves turned up their silver sides, the brown dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet, and row on row of tiny wind waves fall, flowed up the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died, and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. 
Suddenly Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water, and flew off down the river. The little snakes did, uh, slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. Lenny came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. With the, a little bird, when a little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, his head jerked up and he strained toward the sound with eyes and ears until he saw the bird, and then he dropped his head and drank again. One thing that you should notice, guys, is the similarity between how the book opened and how this chapter opened, and it's almost kind of a, a repeat of of that opening, um, which is, you know, but but with much more context now. When he finished, he sat down on the bank with his side to the pool so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He, remem he embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountain seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I didn't forget, you bet. God damn. Hide in the brush and wait for George. He pulled his hat down low over his eyes. George gonna give me hell, he said. George gonna wish he was alone and not have me bothering him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountaintops. I can go right off there and find a cave he said, and he continued sadly, and never have no ketchup, but I won't care. If George don't want me, I'll go away. I'll go away. And then, from out of Lenny's head, there came a little fat old woman. She wore thick bullseye glasses, and she wore a huge gingham apron with pockets, and she was starched and clean. She stood in front of Lenny and put her, eye, her hands on her hips, and she frowned disapprovingly at him. Now, obviously, this is Lenny's imagination, just in case you're wondering what's happening here. And when she spoke, it was in Lenny's voice. I told you and told you, she said. I told you, mind George, because he's such a nice fella and good to you. But you don't never take no care. You done bad things. And Lenny answered her. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. I couldn't help it. You never, uh, you never give a thought to George, she went on in Lenny's voice. He been doing nice things for you all the time. When he, when he got a piece of pie and you, you always got half or more than half. And if they was any ketchup, why he give it all to you. I know, said Lenny miserably. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. She interrupted him. All the time he could have had you he could have had such a good time if he was if it wasn't for you. He would have took his pay and raised hell in a whorehouse, and he could have sat in a pool room and played snooker. But he got to take care of you. Lenny moaned in grief. I know, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I got I'll go right off in the hills and find a cave and I'll live there so I won't be no more trouble to George. You just say that, she said sharply. You're always saying that, and you know son of a bitch and well, you, you ain't never gonna do it. You'll just stick around and stew the bejesus out of George all the time. Then he said, I might just as well go away. George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits now. Aunt Clara was gone, and from out of Lenny's head there came a gigantic rabbit. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it waggled its ears and crinkled its nose at him, and it spoke in Lenny's voice, too. Ten rabbits, it said scornfully. You crazy bastard. You ain't fit to lick the boots of no rabbit. You'd forget him and let him go hungry. That's what you'd do. And then what would George think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a grease jack pin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it don't do no good. If you think George gonna let let you ten rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He's gonna beat hell out of you with a stick. That's what he's gonna do. Now Lenny retorted belligerently. He ain't neither. George won't do a thing like that. I'll, I've no, I've knew George since I forget when, and he ain't never raised his hand to me with a stick. 
he's nice to me, he ain't gonna be mean. Well, he's sick of you, said the rabbit. He's going to beat hell out of you and then go away and leave you. He won't, said Le cried Lenny. Lenny cried frantically. He won't. He won't do nothing like that. I know, George. Me and him travels together. But the rabbit repeated softly over and over. He going to leave you, you crazy bastard. He going to leave you all alone. He going to leave you, crazy bastard. Lenny put his hands over his ears. He ain't. I tell you, he ain't. And he cried, oh, George, George, George. George came quietly out of the out of the brush, and the rabbit scuttled back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, what the hell are you yelling about? Jo Lenny got up on his knees. You ain't going to leave me, are you, George? I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No. I knowed it, Lenny cried. You ain't that kind. George was silent. Lenny said, George, yeah, I done another bad thing. Don't make no difference, George said, and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Lenny said, George, yeah, ain't you going to give me hell? Give you hell? Sure, like you always done before, like if I didn't have you, I'd take my 50 bucks. Jesus Christ, Lenny, you can't remember nothing that happens, but you remember every word I say. Well, ain't you going to say it? George shook himself. He said woodenly, if I was alone, I could live so easy. His voice was monotonous, had no emphasis. I could get a job and not have no mess. He stopped. Go on, said Lenny. And when the end of the month come. And when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a cat house. He stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go on, George. Ain't you gonna give me no more hell? No, said George. Well, I can go away, said Lenny. I'll go right off in the hills and find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said. I want you to stay with me here. Lenny said craftily. Tell me like you done before. Tell you what? About the other guys and about us. George said. Guys like us got no family. They make a little stake and then they blow at him. They ain't got nobody in the world that gives a hoot and a hell about him. But not us, Lenny cried happily. Tell about us now. George was quiet for a moment. But not us, he said. Because? Because I got you and... And I got you. We got each other, that's what. That gives a hoot and a holler about us, Lenny cried in triumph. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing and the leaves rustled and the wind the wind waves flowed up the green pool. And the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. George took off his hat. His hand, he said shakily, take off your hat, Lenny. The air feels fine. Lenny removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer and the evening came fast. On the wind, the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. Lenny said, Tell how it's going to be. George had been listening to the distant sounds. For a moment, he was businesslike. Look across the river, Lenny, and I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Lenny turned his head and looked off across the pool and up the darkening slopes of the gabalins. We're gonna get a little place, George began. He reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger. He snapped off the safety, and the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head, at the place where the spine and the skull were joined. 
A man's voice called up from the river, and another man answered. Go on, said Lenny. George raised the gun, and his hand shook, and he dropped his hand to the ground again. Go on, said Lenny. How's it gonna be? We gonna get a little place? We'll have a cow, said George, and we'll have maybe a pig and chickens. And down the flat we'll have a little piece of alfalfa for the rabbits, Lenny shouted. For the rabbits, George repeated. And I get to tend the rabbits, and you get to tend the rabbits. Lenny giggled with happiness, and live on the fat of the land. Yes. Lenny turned his head. No, Lenny, look down there across the river like you can almost see the place. Lenny obeyed him. George looked down at the gun. There were crashing footsteps in the brush now. George turned and looked toward them. Go on, George. When we gonna do it? Gonna do it soon. Me and you. You and me. Everybody gonna be nice to you. Ain't gonna be no more trouble. Nobody gonna hurt nobody nor steal from them. Lenny said, I thought you was mad at me, George. No, said George. No, Lenny. I ain't mad. I never been mad, and I ain't now. That's the thing I want you to know. The voices came close now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Lenny begged, Let's do it now. Let's get that place now. Sure, right now. I gotta... <clears throat> we gotta... And George raised the gun and steadied it, and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his head's hands steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. Lenny jarred, and then settled slowly forward to the sand, and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him back up the bank near the pile of old ashes. The brush seemed filled with cries and with the sound of running feet, Slim's voice sounded, George, George, where are you out, George? But George sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his right hand that had thrown the gun away. The group burst into the clearing and Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying on the ground. Got him, by God! He went over and looked down at Lenny, and then he looked back at George. Right in the back of the head, he said softly. Slim came directly to George and sat down beside him, sat very close to him. Never you mind, said Slim. A guy got to sometimes. But Carlson was standing over George. How'd you do it? he asked. I just done it, George said tiredly. Did he have my gun? Yeah, he had your gun. And you got it away from him, and you took it, and you killed him? Yeah, that's how. George's voice was almost a whisper. He looked steadily at his right hand that had held the gun. Slim twitched George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and you'll go in and get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Yeah, a drink. Slim said, You had a, George. I swear you had a. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them, and Carlson said, Now what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? So that's the end of the book. A lot of people think about it as kind of a surprise ending. Um, maybe you were surprised or maybe you weren't, but I think it's worth revisiting these questions now. So how does George act to protect Lenny from the gang of men? Would you even agree that it's a that it's an act of protection? Second, who wins and who loses in the end? Are there any winners and are there any losers? Are there only winners? Are there only losers? Um, can we even answer that question?
I'm going to leave those up to you. Um, I also want you to think about, in preparation for the uh, final discussion, uh, which will be online tomorrow, these questions. Is Lenny responsible for his actions? So, is he responsible for what he caused and what, what happened? Second is, is George a kind person and what makes you say so? And third, was the dream of the little place with the rabbits a realistic dream? Why or why not? So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on those things. I'm not going to tell you what I think, really, because I don't want to poison the well, so to speak, and make you think a certain way. I'm going to wait with my opinions until I hear what you have to say. Remember that tomorrow we have a final discussion board on Canvas. And until we get there, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay sane.